Yeah. Okay, so I think uh, we can get started with the second part of the day. And uh, we will be about the approach language. So the first part of the day was the difficult part. You had the uh, uh, painful exposure into the advanced algorithms. And this part is actually going to be easier. Right? It's the first part of the second part. I'm going to make you claim about the second part of the second part. But the first part is like, should, should be fun. Um, so, how about that's me. And, uh, so yeah, I'll, I'll talk about how. So, when Boris confessed that it was the first time for a long time that he was doing half an hour, uh, an hour and a half lecture, uh, I'm going to make a stronger confession because it's the first time I'm doing that long lecture. So, there is a good chance that either I'll finish in like an hour and we will have to do something else, or, equally possible, I will run late or just keep a good chunk of material, but I'll try not to. So this is what I need to cover in the first part. So I will go into the introduction of how I read out and try to place out into the stack of the semantic technologies uh, related to other things which you are probably familiar, more or less like other events or the DL. Um, talk a little bit about tools to give you an impression of how much you are the landscape of tooling how to curve this. And, and then we'll just dive into the basic axioms and expressions and, and, uh, and um, entities and how you deal with data. And uh, maybe, if we have time, I'll also cover the number of the call. So why, why, why are you all here? Why should you worry about how? Why the rest of this main web community? which, as you know, we don't know what that was, but people seem to worry about how. So why? why? Why things like RDF not sufficient? We have RDF, which is a great language for expressing facts. So, which is uh, not too far away from relational databases. It's just a bit less structured. It's a graph language, so you can express lots of things using RDF. It has a very simple data model, which is not so simple as we'll see later, but as a cost approximation, which is the graph language, and everyone understands what the graph is, which is connect nodes, but arcs, and that's what we learn in the second year, in the first year of knowledge. Everyone's familiar with that. And that's a low level data integration tool, so we connect nodes from different graphs, integrate your data and browse, it's all fine. So, you may claim that there's no schema for RDF. Well, RDF has no capabilities to express the structure of the data, only the data itself, but there is a standard called RDFS, schema language for RDF, which is an extension of RDFS, uh, of RDF, and uh, it's perfectly fine for simple, for simple schemas. If all you want to do is to express a simple taxonomy, which plus some class relationship, you don't need things like how, that RDFS is perfectly the appropriate tool for you. And you can get some simple inferencing, which is, yeah. Works okay, like transitivity of some class relationship. If 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 I'm a, if I'm a person, if I'm a male, and male is a subclass of person, but I'm a person, it's the kind of inference you get on DFS. Um, the problem so where the problem begin, the problems begin is when you try to go beyond them. So for example, you can say that the domain of that's why predicate in RDF is woman. So everyone uh, who is wife is a woman. Uh, but you cannot say that, say, Pita as some woman is married. Or you cannot say that whoever Peter is married to is necessarily a woman. So if you need something like that, then you know immediately that, oh, OK, or oh, RDFS can be or something else. Uh, Another problem with RDFS, if you actually try to understand on a, on, a, on, a, on a deeper level, is that while it's very weak uh, in terms of expressivity, it's actually pretty really hard computation. So the balance is not great. So if you know something about the complexity class, and we should by this time of the, of, of the program, you, you know that if something is incomplete, that's, it's a spirit. 
quite far. There's no hope it's going to work in all possible cases. There will be always cases when it's going to take longer than until the heat death of the universe. So not a good thing. So no good balance between expressivity and complexity. Um, um, so what we really need in those cases is a language which provides a decent balance between what you can say and how far it will take before from the point you press the button reason in protege until the point you actually get the sun in the back. So that, that, that time actually reflects, to some approximate, it reflects the complexity of the language. And another desirable property for the modern language would be that even if it's powerful, but you don't use all the features which it supports, then you're still in good shape in terms of complexity. So for example, if the language supports universals or like GCIs, but I don't use GCIs in my language because there's no need for my modern to use GCIs, then you shouldn't worry about the extra complexity that the GCIs are creating to language. That property is typically referred to as a pay as you go behavior. You pay the price of uh, reasoning time as you add more features into your ontology. If you don't use the extra features, then you don't have to worry about it. And the language with its properties in the semantic web landscape is called OWL2. It has been designed uh, with these goals in mind. So the working group, a uh, number of smart people, took a number of years, a number of fights, to actually design the language which tries to meet those goals. And this is why it's me here today talking about it. So, before we go into the introduction, uh, I will try and introduce the two big application areas for OWL and for ontologies in general. Uh, there are more than these two actually, but these two I think are very really and they are um, quite common. So first of all, you, there are applications which need uh, vocabularies, formally defined, unambiguous collections of terms and, 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 and relationships between terms and which can grow big and be complex. So for, that kind, for those kind of applications, uh, and now, as, as you know by now, those big collections of sort of called T-boxes. Um, so basically what they need, they need how to maintain terminology. So medical applications, biological applications, chemical applications, they all fall into this category. Completely different kind of applications, those which deal with lots and lots of data. So the schemas are pretty small, may or may not, well, they exist, but they're not maybe hundreds or thousands of classes, so it's comparably small these days. But the number of facts like in the database, that amount grows big. And they need different capabilities. So, as I said, time and knowledge management. So the prime, the prime customers in that area are applications from healthcare, life science, biological, chemical community. So in Manchester, for example, there's a big group of people, the bioinformatics group of people, who all do modeling. Uh, they model complex things. Uh, there's another group, there's other, other groups in the, in the US who model like genes, or they model chemical pathways. And um, so what they do, they create large key boxes, which sometimes grow really huge. So, there are some canonical uh, examples of those taxonomies. So, so the ICD, which is International Classification of Diseases, currently not in our ontology, but is going to be in the next story. So you all uh, you know what ICD is. So for example, when we die, someone dies. <laughs> I die. When someone dies, Someone is actually going to examine the reason of the death and put a label why that person died, what was the cause of the death. And it happens all the time because the government needs to know how many people died of uh, pneumonia in the last year. Or of cancer, different kinds of cancer. You need to run those reports every year. How, how are you going to do that? Or if you need to know how many people died of all kinds of cancer, how do you know which diseases are cancers, which diseases are not cancers? So the World Health Organization maintains the huge taxonomy of those things called International Classification of Diseases, 
and the decision has been made to actually move to now for the next version of number 11. Of course, now that's a team which someone already talked about. It's not a big medical anthology. Uh, now it's close to half million axioms, I believe, um, in EL. Um, used uh, for all kinds of uh, medical stuff. So, for example, applications for SNOMED different. There are lots of different kinds of applications. There could be medical diagnosis tools, electronic medical records, learning statistical uh, tools. And the, point, the important point about all those applications, even though they are also different, and they do different things for different people, and users are different as well, the applications need to agree on what the, what the terms mean. There should be no misinterpretation of the same term across the wide spectrum of applications. For example, if you say your electronic medical record of cancer is one thing, but when you teach students, they misinterpret and they think that cancer is actually something else, well, that's a problem. You don't want that to happen. It's quite important. And that's, that's where ontology, ontologies are applied, so that you fix the semantics and you say, okay, that's the right definition of the term, so please use that everywhere. And when you do this kind of application, the most important thing is the scalable schema reasoning. So you need to uh, do T-box classification and entailment, and it just scale to this kind of sizes. Um, data centric applications, completely different story. Instead of being schemas, they usually have a lot of data. And the data, uh, it's typically stored in some sort of persistent storage which you are all familiar with, like a database, for example, relational database. There's a lot of stuff in there. And, uh, um, or in this case, it's an RTF database. And there's a little, tiny knowledge on top of that, which, for example, can say, well, okay, uh, managers are people, and the heads of departments are people, and uh, if you need to for all people, you need to find all managers and all heads of departments, you know. And, uh, and what they need, they need scalable query answering, which scales to the large amounts of data they have. They don't care so much about scaling to the, to the size of schemas, because schemas are comparably small with respect to data. But this part is pretty small, but this part grows like the target. And uh, there are different sub languages in the out family which supports this use case. And uh, the last thing I want to talk about in this application introduction is the data integration. So one very typical situation is that the data sources are not integrated in a single database. It's not like you have a single database for the whole enterprise and the whole company. Usually the case that data sits in uh, disparate data silos, as you, if you still remember the first lecture, the first data machine. So it might see it in a relational database, it might see it in an RDF database, some part of it might still see it in electronic spreadsheets. I don't know if you ever, ever saw a horrific uh, situation where all of the accounting information is like, um, it's all in an electronic spreadsheet, it grows like 100 megabytes. I've seen that and it's not pretty thing to look at. But it does happen. And what you need to do in those cases, you need the way to query all the all that data which sits in all sorts of different places as if it were in a single integrated database. Happens all the time. So what do you do in this case? Well you have to you can go to each of those databases, query independently and integrate the result, and you have to uh, understand that terms they use in one database may not be the same terms they use in another database. So in one database they say it's head of department. In another, in, in another database they say it's department head. How do you know it's the same thing? You have, you'll have to write the queries for each database specifically, integrate them, uh, execute them independently and integrate the result. It's a very, very daunting job. So what you do in this case is, since semantic web, well, some some syntax is wrong, you actually can uh, put an abstract layer on top of this mess, all this disparate data style, and you, in your ontology, you 
uh, specify how the data should be integrated. The department head here is the head of the department over there, and what we call car here is automobile over there. You specify the mappings. You uh, you take a component which will um, actually execute the query uh, by taking the schema mappings into the account. It will go to all the different databases, reformulate your query in terms of those databases, integrate the result back to your unit. So if you look from from here, you would view your data as it seeds in a single integrated database, even though on the physical level that's not the case. Um, and since those applications are different, one size is not at all. There is no language which would satisfy all the different means of all those applications. So how to comes as a collection of languages, and you will talk more about that tomorrow. Uh, Marcus will uh, tell about the profiles. But as a collection of sub-languages called profiles, called AutoRL, QL, EL, they're all subsumed by the more expressive language called DL, and there's also Alpha beyond that, which I don't want to talk about at all. And if you still remember about something called DL Light, then my best advice to forget about that. No longer relevant was a failure, uh, let's put it that way, and it's been substituted by a well designed collection of uh, languages. Alright, so today, uh, since semantic, semantic technologies are becoming mainstream technologies and all these areas, we have a rich collections of tools which make your life easier. Comparing to what we had like, 15 years ago or 10 years ago, it's, the situation is drastically different. We have reasoners. We have different reasoners. We have expressive, heavyweight reasoners which do all sorts of heavy lifting. Uh, pellet, back plus plus, which, do, which have to do this crazy sort of optimization stuff to reason with expressive ontologies, mostly to support uh, complex modeling. You have reasoners which only support lightweight language like EL. No one uses uh, the pellet for things like tsunami, they should not use. Um, you have semantic databases which support um, loads of data. So if you have loads of data, hundreds of uh, millions of facts, you're not going to load that into memory of a single reasoner. That's going to probably kill it. Uh, so what you do instead is store it as a, as a collection of facts in database. Databases can scale to that. They use secondary storage, no problem. Those semantic databases, they actually provide some reasoning capabilities it doesn't mean that they implement a specific profile, they, even if they claim they do, it usually means that they well, have to be careful. It's not required in the spec of how anywhere they have to implement all of EL. So nobody forces it. Um, so they may or may not fully implement profiles, but they implement some support. Uh, if you want to use this stuff from, a soft, from an application, programmatically, in Java or C++, then there is support for you. There are APIs like the OWL API, which is de facto standard for interacting with semantic uh, ontologies. If you work on the OWL level and access from Java, uh, there's a whole bunch of RDF based APIs. Gem and Sesame are the um, canonical examples. There are data integration tools, so PTQ is Hello, distributed query thing you which does state integration, there are some others which I just cannot remember at the moment. And beyond that there are ontology measures, aligners, state visualization tools, all sorts of kind of tools which, 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 which work with that. So the tool support is, is getting better very fast. So I got to say it early enough, then later, then uh, how can be in different ways. And you can actually see in many papers, like white papers or somewhere in blogs, anywhere, people saying that, okay, oh, yes, it's something we sitting somewhere on top of RDF, so some extension of RDF, if you need to express the stuff. So, what, so it can be, 
can be viewed that way, really. And I'll try to make it reasonably precise later in the second part, because that's not a part of the easy first part of the lecture, it's part of the complicated second part of the lecture. But for now, I, I'm just saying that it can be viewed that way, and it can be made precise. But mostly, we will view it as the logic, the description logic, language, sorry, but with different syntax, which is hierarchized so that you can link data on web. Web friendly syntax. But underneath it's inscription logic. That's, that's, that's the way I would like to present it today. And these views are compatible to a certain extent. And um, again, I will talk a little bit about that later. For now, you just need to know that it's not like these are completely incompatible things. They are compatible. And lots of people, some, some, some people, spend a good part of their lives defining this compatibility. All right, so before we move on, um, I will talk for a few minutes about what you should already know if you have any experience with databases. And I can count on you having some having had some exposure to databases. Because if you've not seen a database before, then well it might be a bit tricky for you. But I hope you all know what a database is, relation database. And usually there is a separation between the schema of that database. You define your tables, attributes, or your relations, which attributes are keys, which are foreign keys for this table, link to some other table, stuff like that. That's, that's, that's Right? You define it usually before, especially with relational, you define it before the raw data, because it's a pain to change later. And then there's data, which is actual content, uh, how you populate those tables, what, what actually sits in those tables. So let's take it. And that separation is present now too. And you've seen that before, I just need to reiterate, or would like to reiterate before we move on. So the T box terminological part of the ontology, of an ontology, is similar to the schema in database world, and a box is similar to the data in the database world. Um, both key box statements and a box statements are called axioms, and I'm going to use the term axiom from now on. And when I say ontology, from now on, I mean a combination of a T box an A-box, combination of a T-box collection of axioms and an A-box collection of axioms. And uh, throughout the lecture I'll be using family example, since well, we haven't had that before and you're familiar with domain and uh, I was too late to get another domain, so I'm going to piggyback on what you said before. And so I will be demonstrating modeling on parents, children, cousins, on samples. So, and as I, as I said before, we need to define those terms such that different applications which choose our ontology do not disagree on, about, on what those terms mean. So, a small part of our little tiny family ontology, FOIL contains axioms like parent is either mother or father, father and mother are usually disjoint concepts. In our world, one person cannot be more than the other. Um, every person must have one parent, parent of each kind. Oh, okay, there's a type of the okay. And your parents, parents, your grandparents. And our data is going to be one specific family. Does anyone recognize the family, by the way? I wasn't sure how much that city is popular in Russia. I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of that cartoon, but I don't know how, 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 that, how widespread that means. So we have a specific family called the Griffin family, which, is, uh, which consists of those <coughs> six individuals. So that, that guy in the middle is Peter, Peter Griffin, the head of the family. And uh, that's Lois, and these are their kids. Um, uh, it's Chris, Megan, or Meg. She's kind of black sheep in the family, nobody likes her. And uh, they're awesome individuals too. 
And that dog can, who is very sad usually has alcohol problems and can speak, it's called Brian. They are all members of the Penguin in Um Okay, so I was using an analogy in database world, but I have to warn you that there is a specific moment where the dog's analogies have to stop. And if you keep on going that, down that path of making analogies, then, well, it's important to stop at the right moment. So, one particular thing is that databases are closed oral collections of facts. What's said in database is the only things which are true. If it's not, if it's not said explicitly, then it's false. So, if you have any, if you had any exposure to logic program, that's usually known as negation is failure, a concept. Ontologies, on the other hand, are open world uh, thingies. So if you don't say something that ontology does not mean that this is false, it just left unspecified. So things can be legitimately missed in ontology, not in database, but in ontology they can be. So things can be explicitly true, implicitly true, they can be false, or they can be unknown. For example, if we say explicitly Peter is a father, because we know that it has kids, those are three. So Peter is explicitly Peter is a father is explicitly true statement in our domain. Implicitly true screens and next to their grandparents because Lois, their mother, has parents. Not sure about Peter's parents, but at least there's one couple of grandparents. Um, there are things which are false. For example, if you say that Lois is a father, that's explicitly false. Well, that's it. But that's just false. Again, and the, the reason is false because she is a mother, so we, don't, we know she did not be a father. And there are three things which are unknown. For example, the axiom uh, Chris is a parent is neither false nor true. We don't know if Chris has been a uh, kid. So not because we've not said that in our culture. Um, and the other thing which I will keep going back to throughout the talk is the lack of the unique name assumption. So in databases, it's typically the case that um, if certain things have different names, they stand for different things. In the outer world, it's not true, and in the structure world, it's not true either. So if one thing can have distinct, different names, you can say, uh, I'm from New York, or I'm from Big Apple. And Big Apple usually stands for New York. One thing can have different names. That's the kind of flexibility you need quite often. And in, in our case, uh, if we never said that pre and is two are different, then they can all stand for the same, the same key. And I'll show you an example of where that actually affects the results. Not, not always in, in an obvious way. Um, OWL is also not a programming language. But again, I'm counting on you having some experience with programming, at least some, some of you. So modeling in description logic in OWL is declarative. So it has no procedural semantics. So for example, if you think how uh, integrity of your database is defined. If you have a database, you have some triggers which are executed every time someone changes the data. You have some stored procedures. Well, that, well, that implicitly the semantics of consistency is something like, oh well, if all my triggers executed and no one raised any exception and, uh, and all my stored procedures did not fail, that, 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 that makes you the data is consistent. Not the case at all. There's nowhere in the specification of the language uh, a thing something like, if something is evaluated to true, then it's true. It's never the case. It's all declared. And finally, OWL is not a schema language. It does not... So using OWL, you, you cannot impose syntactic constraints on documents, typically, like in XML schema you can. So you, you cannot say that, okay, all ontologies which import this ontology have to have certain kind of syntactic constructs in them. You do not uh, use OWL as a tool to validate uh, some other piece of OWL. Um, and uh, you also need to know that differently from uh, programming languages, or schema 
regional languages. Uh, even though we, I keep on saying that our, our, our single language actually has multiple syntaxes, uh, which are all equivalent in terms of, uh, oh, okay, uh, all equivalent in terms of expressive power. So they can be split into large families of syntaxes. Uh, so first is the RTF basic. So RTF can be uh, RTF graphs can be described syntactically in, 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 in different ways. You can have XML serialization, you can have turtle, which is more concise and nicer format than RTF XML, and entry, entry, both, and stuff like that. And, and uh, in those instances, ontology would be represent this collection of RTF triples. And you also have a number of Syntaxes which actually represent axioms, our axioms. Uh, those are our XML syntax, the functional syntax, which goes by default in the spec, and that's the one I'm going to be using in this talk. And uh, there is a Manchester syntax, and that's what we saw in Polish yesterday. So I could have used Manchester syntax, but I just use functions. Um, yes. So the reason I use functional syntax is because I want to avoid out uh, RTF pattern as much as possible. Horrendous thing. And I don't want to, you know, present snippets of uh, XML that will take a lot of space on my slides. Hard for you to read and so on. Alright, so that was the introduction. Um, and now we move into the essential building blocks of ontologies. And this part of the talk is going to be Boring because you know most of it already is just going to come in different syntax. But if you can reconstruct the analogy to the other, that's good. That's good already. So entities, things you know as concepts, roles, and individuals from your yesterday description logic language, are now going to be named classes, properties, and individuals. So there's a little bit of a uh, terminology mismatch between the logic world and the our world. So on, on the DL side things are called concepts and now they call classes, what was called roles here is called properties here. Of course other can take for people. So for example, a good deal of people who write papers for the our conferences or semantic web conferences, they also write papers for description logic conferences. And it's enormous pain to you know, switch the terminology uh, from one notation to another. Now we now have to remember that all their concepts are now classes, all their roles are now properties. And if you don't do that, then you get some annoying review from, 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 from that conference saying that, ooh, the terminology is not appropriate for this community. So it's just, it's, it's, it's really painful. So we have to suffer like, a few times a year, so you will have to suffer in this section. <laughs> <laughs> well, my apologies for that, but that's a sad, sad truth. <laughs> so, you know, it's not too bad. It's, 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 it's not that bad. So, individuals. Individuals, like inscription logic, oh, thank God they did not invent the name for individuals. They could have instances, but they don't. They didn't. So individuals are specific named objects. Uh, so I'm going to restrict attention to named individuals. Peter, Lois, Stu, Matt, Brian, Chris, but those are all uh, individuals. Oh, by the way, I forgot to say that all those entities, if they are named, the name comes as Nairai. Nairai is like a URI, except that we can do it actually with new projects. So you can have a non no, not nasty characters in the, in, in, in the name. Classes are sets of individuals, like family, parts, so, so they are not uh, specific objects, they are named collections of objects. And properties, you know, as roles, are sets of pairs of individuals or relations. And uh, those I will write from the small letter, so it's easier for you to distinguish from classes and individuals. Married to, child of, those are properties. Um, yes, one thing we need to know that an LDL, and most of this talk is about LDL, you can declare those properties, which is again not too unusual. You, you, you know how to do it in programming languages, and you need to do it in LDL as well. There is a special kind of uh, construct in LDL called declarations, and uh, uh, entities are to that. In particular, you need to declare object and data properties. Because if you don't specify which, which is object, which is data, I know that you don't know what data property is yet, but that will come later. But I'm just saying that if you distinguish um, 
one kind of entity from another kind of entity to use declarations. Okay, so that, that, that was about named entities, classes, and properties. Now we move to complex uh, entities, which are known as expressions. So class expressions, which was I explained as concept expressions yesterday. So named classes can be combined into more complex expressions. For example, if you have main things, or also known as atomic things sometimes, atomic is used by the logical domain of the person, parent, um, family, they, oh yes, and, and, and the two predefined entities which you can know about from yesterday, it's the only difference is that top is now called our thing, and bottom is now called all nothing. Um, they are also named, so these things can be combined into class expressions. Class expressions are also classes, so they are also interpreted as sets, collections of individuals, uh, but they no longer have names, they don't have IRIs. And uh, expressions can be made of classes using uh, propositional constructs, non propositional constructs. And I will show you examples of those. Oh, but before I do that, I will, I will also talk about properties too. So properties can also be named and complex. So named prop properties, just as named classes, are identified with IRIs, like matter to, spouse of, those IRIs. Similar to classes, we have two predefined properties. Um, called top object property, which connects every to every pair, every pair of individuals in your domain, always like, exactly in exactly the same way as every individual is a member of thing. Every pair of individuals is a member of all top object property, same for all bottom object property, but next to nothing. <coughs> and um, and as you will know later from the end of this lecture, maybe the next lecture is that properties in all are common to flavors, object properties and data. So don't worry about that for now, we'll talk about it later. And properties also can be uh, complex. So there are named properties and property expressions. Property expressions, just as last expression, do not have an IRI, but they are still interpreted as relations. If you see the name property, that means it's interpreted as a relation of the domain. Okay, so the propositional part is easy, and again, you should know that by now. So the only difference is in that. Um, so our DL is a propositionally complete language. So you have a whole range of Boolean connectives, uh, conjunction, disjunction, and negation. You can use all those. So these are examples of those uh, constructs in the functional syntax. So the intersection of stands for uh, intersection for and, union of stands for or for disjunction, and the complement of stands for negation. So if you have um, a class of women, which with uh, instances of men and boys, you have a class of Parents, which consists of Peter and Lois, and you can talk about the intersection of the class, which is on the Lois. You can talk about the union of that class, which is going to be all three in the wall in the picture. Or you can talk about complement, like if you take the complement of woman and parent, then you're going to have men. Um, that was about the positional part of LDL, but it was not the positional constructors. And uh, those we those you saw today and yesterday as universals and existential. So I'll start with existential. So the syntax again is a little bit different, but the semantics is, is the same. So by using this last expression, we define uh, a class of all objects that have uh, male children. So, in this particular interpretation, we have Stu and Peter, who are men. You have uh, Lois, and uh, that's mother Barbara, 
who are uh, not men, who are not men. Let's put it that way because I'm not, I'm not saying they're women. Um, and the interpretation of the as child property is that Peter is a has two as a child, Lois has two as a child, father has Lois as a child. So according to this, in, in this interpretation, the interpretation of this last expression is going to be Lois and Peter, because only them, only they have a male successor. Is that, is that clear? Barbara is not here because she does not have a male successor. Uh, Stuart is not here because he does not have any, any has child successors. Universals uh, for completely the same way as in description logic. Uh, the syntax is the functional syntax to the construct of object all values from. Uh, so this concept expression talks about all objects such that all their children are women. And uh, if we take an interpretation with Stewie, Lois, Barbara, and Meg, these are women. This is a man, and um, then the interpretation of as child is such that uh, Lois has two as a child, Barbara has uh, Lois as a child, Lois has also Matt as a child. Matt does not have any kids yet, and um, in this model, uh, the instances of this last expressions are Barbara and Matt. And I sincerely hope that uh, we... Did I... You forgot one, didn't you? One more, oh, one, more. one more individual. Oh, yes. Okay. So where's the mistake, though? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh. You planned that, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. Does anyone, can anyone spot... Okay, let's talk about Mac in this picture. Why did I... Why did it... Why did Mac ended up in the interpretation of this class? Of all, of all objects who have only women as children. But, so, the Barbara is pretty clear. Uh, her only child is Lois, and Lois is a woman. Why, why, why is that here? Because she had no child. Yes, okay. So she, had, uh, she could have. Alright, so, okay, so what's the problem with the. With the where's the mistake? <laughs> that one was correct. But maybe there is something else missing. So I know there are at least two people in this room who know the answer, but I'm not going to let them stay. Only two? Well, at least two. Good. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> at least four. <laughs> at least four. four. But I, I, I do hope there will be something else. Someone else. What can you say? So. Okay. Ah, but uh, she also can have a child or uh, a man. Maybe. No, no, this interpretation is it, it, it's not the specification of the model. So, it, it, but we're talking just this interpretation. Yes, we're talking just this interpretation. We are not talking about any other possible interpretation of of the situation of, of the domain. But according according to this particular interpretation, is there anyone else who might be in this concept? Think about that. Why men do that? You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. Just to just, just this ball of people. Don't, don't be embarrassed with making mistakes. We have an answer here. And I, mean, I screwed up already, so why, why are you embarrassed with the problem? We have an answer here. Okay. What's that? Stewie. Stewie, yes. Stewie should be in the orange circle, and it's not. Okay. So, don't, so when, you use this, when you use the slides, just click no. <laughs> Wrong. Alright, okay. So, now we move to the left boring part, which was not covered yesterday. So, you know that you can describe your classes by imposing restrictions yeah. and properties. I mean, you, you can describe them as having uh, an all object having a particular successor, or all objects such that all successors have particular parts. You can describe things, but sometimes you just want to enumerate things. You don't want to. So, for example, if you if you want a class named the uh, Griffin children. One way you can go about it, you can say, okay, my Griffin children are all children such that they have Lois as a mother and Peter as a father and blah blah stuff like that. But if you know that there are only three 
scales in your domain which are never going to be named to the group family, then why, why don't you just enumerate them? That's kind of a natural thing to do. If you want to define a concept of European countries, why you can say it's all countries which are physically located in Europe, or you can just go and list all the, all, all the European countries. So, uh, and the now 2 dl uh, provides specific construct called nominals such that you can actually take named individuals and say, okay, these are the only uh, objects in the extension of my class. Nothing. Um. So again, the question to you, in light of what I said about the open world and the name assumption, does this mean, does it mean that the class uh, contains exactly three objects in all interpretations, now we talk all interpretations, or at least three or at most three. Exactly. Okay. Any other? Any takers? At least three most. Okay. Well, at least at most. We can't. It's basic. It's All right. So, how many people think it's exactly three? Just, just. Come on. You're here to learn, you're not here to, to impress anyone. Okay, but it's How many things it's at least three? Okay, five. Oh, my, oh seven. Wow. Uh, how many think it's at most three? Alright, well, you have to raise your hand last. You're <laughs> <laughs> not here to go. So, uh, Alright, so, so in fact, in fact, the semantics. I mean, it's not completely fair because it did not find a semantic format, right? so you have an excuse for providing wrong answers, <laughs> if that's what you want to do. But the thing is, um, this class contains at most three individuals. One name cannot stand for more than one object, but two names can stand for one object. So I did not say that Stu, Matt, and Chris are all different, so they can be the same, or Stu and Matt can denote the same individual, or Matt and Chris can denote the same individual, or all three of them can stand for the same individual. But if you have a specific name here like Stu, it cannot be interpreted as, uh, as two objects, because the interpretation is functional. And this is actually the, the only syntactic construct in, in the whole of how and all the files of how which restricts the extension of the class. It's the only way how you can say that since since there is no no way to say that okay my class is cardinal to no more than ten, you cannot say that directly. That's the only way how you can you know, close the class. Honest, do you disagree with that? Yeah, uh, second thoughts not in the L because the top role is defined to be uh, simple, right? Uh, it's non simple in how to write. Right? It's not simple. It's yeah. non simple for no reason. <laughs> but otherwise, you could use uh, inverse uh, or cardinal restriction with the top row to do this. Yes. Yeah. All right, another thing which you did not see yet is the self restriction. So you had you had existential restriction. So you had stuff like exist RC. As you know, that's the set of all objects which are connected by L to C, to, to a member of class C. But sometimes you can say that I want to express the set of all people who like themselves. Perfectly reasonable thing to do. You don't want to say I want to express the class of all people who like someone, or some person, or someone who is not a person. You want to say that they like themselves. And what you do for that you use the construct called object itself. So for example, in this interpretation, uh, Stewie would be a perfect, perfect example of an individual license of what he's, he really does. And uh, in this interpretation, uh, Brian would not be a member of that class because Brian is depressive, he hates himself, he likes boys, and he has all of the controls. Okay, so at, at that point, uh, pictures will mostly vanish because that's how far I 
I managed to do that. But but you need to know that now you also need you also have things like cardinal restriction, qualified cardinal restriction as a as expressed in DLs. So you can say the set of all the class of all objects would have uh, at least two children without specifying who those children are, just some children. Or you can say the class of all people who have at most two parents. And, uh, and I believe you already know how to interpret these things. And so I will not go into the details. Uh, what you saw yesterday, if you attended the uh, protege modeling crash course, <laughs> um, you had to use inverse rows. And a number of people asked what those are. So the inverse rows, which are called inverse properties in L, are, well, they are interpreted as inverse relations. So they just go in exactly the opposite way as the relation itself. So if you have it, the property as parent, which is interpreted as a relation as parent, like Stuart has Peter is a parent, in that case, uh, Peter has Stuart as a as a successor of inverse as parent. So they go just if you have inverses in the language you can revert your So did you want the bottom relation to be has child and the expression of there to be has parent or oh, yeah. the expression sure. of there to be has child and yes. the it has to be has parent here. That, that, that and then has child. No, 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 I'm not talking about sending names to inverse relations yet. I'm, I'm, I've not covered the, the, the naming uh, oh, properties okay. yet. I'm, I'm working with expressions. That I see, I see. Okay. So, because I'm not, I will come to that. So, yes, so, well, um, so it has KR would be an inverse of S child. <coughs> Uh, another very important thing uh, in our DL and some other profiles too is that you have you can express chains. You can go from one individual to another, from that individual to someone else, uh, and those are called property chains. And uh, the syntax is also property chains. So, for example, Chris has Lois as a parent, and Lois as a Patrick as a sibling. So you can compose this two and say that okay, Chris is connected to Patrick by the S parent as sibling chain, and later we'll name that as example. So that was the bar of expressions, and now with this toolbox of expressions, you can actually start saying something. We can start making statements about the domain, which are done in axioms. So as I said before, the ontology in the now is a combination of a T box and an A box. And, uh, and those two are both collections of axioms. But axioms but axioms are differently, T box and A box. The T box axioms uh, define or specify relations between classic expressions, and the A box axioms uh, connect individuals to a class or to individuals. So, the typical T-box axiom would be, uh, okay. see how, how easy it is just to scrap terminology. It should be classic inclusion, not concept inclusion. It happens all the time. So the differences between the DL terminology and L terminology are just <coughs> so annoying. So, so if, but, well, okay, so in T-box what you have is the subclass axiom. Uh, so in DL syntax, you have the square set inclusion kind of notation. In the L2 functional syntax, you have subclass of keyboard, and then subclass the superclass, which can be named in this example, or they can be expressions. You can say that grandfather is an intersection of, or implies the intersection of, is a subclass of an intersection of man. And parent. And grandfather's parents, otherwise they wouldn't be grandfathers. Grandfathers. Um, class equivalence. A stronger relationship between two classes. Instead of just saying that 
one class and a subclass of another, you can say the two classes are equivalent, which is a uh, syntactic sugar for subclass inclusion going both ways. So you can say that mother is an intersection of, uh, is equivalent to an intersection of woman and parent, which is exactly the same as saying that mother is a subclass of the intersection and the intersection is a subclass of mother. So informally that means both mothers are women and parents, and every object is both we, woman and the parents mother. The last thing is disjoinments. You can specify that two classes have shared no individual. So they have no instance of one class and an instance of another class. For example, if someone is a father, he's not a mother. If someone is a mother, she's not a father. There is never an individual who is both according to our knowledge. Property axioms. Property axioms uh, also part of T-box. Also, in some DL literature, you can encounter the term R-box for those kind of things. But in our lecture, I will just put down the T-box collection. Um, so essentially, property inclusions is the is what I will spend most time on, and I will distinguish between simple property hierarchies, simple inclusion between two properties, uh, which is uh, defined using the sub-object property of keyword. You can say that has y is a sub-property of s powers. If, two, if, 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 I, if I have a y, then I also have a spouse. Always. Right? It's, it's a sub-property relationship. Uh, but not vice versa. If someone has a spouse, it doesn't matter that it's wife, but maybe the cosmic. Um, or, similarly as with classes, you can have complex expressions. But different different classes, they can be on the left side. So you can say that the object property chain, which as you remember, hopefully, is interpreted st st still as a relation. It can be sub-relation of a main object property. So you can say that um, if you are connected to someone who is a father, and that someone also has another father, or their father, then there is a um, that chain of uh, father and father implies there is a grandfather. And there's a whole bunch of other property axioms which I don't think will be used extensively in the in the rest of the talk. So you can say all other things about properties. You can say that an object property is functional. Um, at this point, I might just start using, yeah, I might start using the, the paper. So the functional object, because I was too lazy to draw it just for all this. So the functional object property means that if you have if you have an object, if that's you, and your R is functional, and you have an R successor in some implementation, uh, some interpretation, then then there will be only one successor. So you cannot have another one, which is distinct from this one. So that's functionality. Your rela the relation is a function. Um, inverse functional object properties, same thing, but that way around. You can have only one mother. Okay, just only one object can be connected to you, while it has mother property. No, mother of. And object property can be reflexive. Who, who remembers from your set theory class what the re reflexive relation is? How many people actually even remember the terms? Just I can't. Okay. Yes. Right. Okay. So those relate. Uh, so that's the the, the the relation which contains all the subgroups. Right. For example, likes. So it's kind of. Typical to find a reasonable model example for a reflexive relation, but in some cases you might actually use it. If you model a domain in which all people like themselves, you might. But you can never assume that it's all people, right? So there could be also a few chairs and tables in there in some interpretations, and then it would again make no sense. I, I think 
It's an accident that we have this feature. Yes, that's, that's why I said it's very difficult to find a reasonable yeah. model. I think it was it's, it's not an accident. It's a we might as well add it because we could, but nobody will ever use it, and it might confuse them. But oh well. That, that, that would I would call it an accident. But yeah, <laughs> it was an accident implies that we didn't deliberately intend to add it. We deliberately well, intended to add it, knowing that it was useless. So for this lecture, I let's think just we have a different concept of we. <laughs> Sorry, okay. I, I, I will use my privilege of in this kind of discussion. Um, so let's just assume that this construct is there for completion purposes, which it probably is, and we can't say that those things. Not all things which you can say are worth saying, but you can. Uh, property is going to be irreflexive, which is the exact opposite uh, of reflexive. It can be transitive. How many people remember what transitivity is? Okay, what's transitivity? Uh, transitivity is when uh, A uh, relies to B and B relies to C and A relies to C. Okay. Yes. If A is related to B by R and B is related to C by R, then it's a shortcut. And they can be symmetric and asymmetric. Uh, you may have noticed that the set of features is not statistically minimal. Some features are expressible using other features. I'm not going into details because from yesterday you know how to express the universal if you have an existential and negation. Right? Right? Okay. Uh, you know that. Uh, well, class equivalence and discharge is kind of trivial. Although I'm still going to ask you, if you have, if you have some class axioms in your syntax and you have complement or negation in your syntax, how would you express discharges? <coughs> how would you say that A and B are disjoint if you can use subclass and negation if you want? Or what? One of those things. For example, you don't have disjoint classes in your, in your toolbox. Is that end of story? Does that mean you cannot say that the uh, father and mother are disjoint? The intersection is both. Right, okay, that's fine. Here I'm going to use the DL syntax because it's boring. <laughs> it's very functional syntax. Okay, any, any, any other ways? This one more. So this is GCI. So my so with, with in protege, I might you know if you want to say exactly this in protege, then well, you to go to this different tab and another tab and try to match up the syntax. So, huh? Someone someone had another idea? Maybe so the subclass of condition. Right. Okay. That's 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 another thing. Is, is it clear to everyone that these two are equal? That's pretty typical in, in, in expressive languages in general, not, not in all. There are usually many ways of saying the same thing as a natural language. Although it's more difficult to, you know, to justify why they are equal. But in formal language, there's no doubt they are equal. Okay. Oh, transitivity. Now that we know that transitivity is, but if you cannot use the transitivity directly, but you have sub-property inclusions and chains, do you think I can express that? So you cannot say that as Karen, um, well, not as Karen, um, it's part of. You cannot say directly that part of is transitive, but you have chains and property inclusions. Do you think you can buy it without trying to copy property keyword? <coughs> so we have part of. And I want to say that if finger is a part of hand, then hand is a part of arm, and arm is a part of body, then finger is a part of hand, arm, and body. And I am a part of my room, then any, any member of my body is a part of that room too. 
chains and inclusions and giving all sorts of hints. Just like, you cannot give me more hints. I just need to try the solution. The chain of two part talk. Uh -huh. Yes. Very nice. Part of composed with part of implies part of. This is a chain. This is a name property. This is the property inclusion axiom. Part of to part of implies part of. Oh, this is a nice one. So eight boxes. At this level of expressivity, when we have subclass of and we have nominals, it turns out that we can ex express all of our A-box without uh, DTK and syntactic constructs for A-box, without a class assertion. So, if you want to say this dude is a person, and you cannot say it directly in A-box, for example, there's no class assertion, we can actually use a T-box action. We can say that the class which, can, which consists of only Stewie is a subclass of person. With the exact, exact same thing as saying that Stewie is a person. Okay, so just to put all this information into sort of perspective. So, what we've done so far, we covered entities class expression object properties, so the main building blocks for your ontology engineering process. What we're going to do next is to touch the other part of OWL, which is all about data. Uh, we'll not be too dissimilar from uh, object, objects, classes, object properties, but it is different. And later, if you still have time, which I doubt, we will go to one logical part of OWL. So yesterday, when you first heard, maybe not first, but when, when you had an in-depth uh, exposure into description logic, I <coughs> explained that the interpretation is a set. It's a domain, which is non empty, but it's a single domain. So OWL actually, in OWL, it's actually, there's more than that. OWL is so-called two-sorted language. So that, there are two kind of things you can, you, you can say now, you can say things about abstract objects, and that's what you learned yesterday, and that's what I tried to explain until now. And uh, there is the concrete or data domain with its own interpretation, um, which is used to interpret facts about things like numbers, strings, dates, timestamps. Uh, binary data in like, or stuff like that. And those are disjoint. So if you read this, the, the formal semantics of Powell, you will see that there is more than just one abstract domain. There is an abstract domain, which we learned about yesterday, and there is a data domain, and those two are disjoint. So Powell is, that's what, that's what it's meant by saying Powell is a two-sorted language. So the abstract domain is used to interpret classes, object properties, individuals, those abstract concepts. And the data domain is used to interpret concrete things, specific numbers, strings, dates, timestamps, uh, things like that. And the abstract domain is arbitrary. Remember that as you do modeling and description logic, there's no control over the abstract domain. That's what sometimes it makes it difficult for people to understand that your interpretation restricts the domain, but it can be the, the, the domain can be a set of pants, or it can be a set of buildings in this city, and a set of people in this room. You cannot say what your domain is. You can just impose restriction by access. With the data domain, it's not quite the case. It is fixed, and uh, it consists of like, all numbers, all strings, all dates, all timestamps, things like that. So why 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 we need this sort of separation? Is that why we just cannot you know model everything in our description logic, description logic knowledge base or OWL, 
as you understand the conclusions and properties, you know how to say that things are disjoint and not properties and connect things by using object properties. Why you need this uh, yeah, an extra component? So the thing is that the abstract part which you learned so, so far is just used to the developing theories about the world and um, it's you have pretty much complete flexibility there in terms of uh, what you do not say is uh, um, it does not mean it does not hold. So you, the only the only way how you can uh, express things is by axioms. Axioms are the only construct which place constraints on the abstract domain. Otherwise, it's completely arbitrary. And the reason it makes sense is because when people model stuff, they create a model, they create theories about the world, they are often quite cautious and pedantical. So if you, hear, if you take a look at how many series of models like about medicine are created, you'll see like groups of people in the meeting room just brainstorming how to fix a model and you know, what, how to do this or that, or should it be existential or universal. And um, it's quite typical that uh, they would much prefer to under-model, under-specify their restriction than, than over-specify them. Because if you, if, you, if you leave something aside and specify it, then what happens is, well, you lose intelligence. Something, may, something which you want to be true may not be provable. But if you go too far, if you over-specify, if you say something which you did not mean to say, then it may turn out that that logic becomes inconsistent. And uh, at this point, like, boom, red taxonomy protege, you can't do anything. And well, you need to collect a bunch of nice people, smart people again in the meeting room, thinking what to do next. But it completely paralyzes the whole modeling and reasoning process. Um, so with data domain, what we don't want to happen, we don't want people in meeting rooms conceptualizing numbers or strings or dates because it has, been, it has been done before long before someone first used the concept of semantic web we know how to operate with numbers we know what the numbers mean we know what it means for one number to be smaller than another number what we don't want to have and we don't want to have 45 internal ontologies done by people who May or may not get it done properly. And, uh, and it's pretty difficult to do actually if you try to do it correctly and uh, for some reason to do it with completeness. You can try it as a home exercise. Just you know, invoke your knowledge about integers, numbers. What it means for one number to be less than another. Is it transitive? It is transitive. Is it reflexive? How do you say that there is only one? Uh, zero, it would not be two zeros in your domain. How do you say that if you are if you are greater than 15 and you are greater than 5? If you have to, if you really have to describe all that, it's not easy. And we, and, 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 and furthermore, it's kind of useless because, well, everyone agrees on, on, on that anyway, so why can't we just do something standard? And that data, in front of all, that standard bit which everybody uses. And we don't want any extra flexibility there because we, we would prefer to keep things fixed. Um, so the data type fix is what we already know about numbers and strings and dates and other things like booleans, for example. So for example, we know that for type of the integer Oh, and by the way, I have to say that now we can use the XML schema data type, and that XSD prefix to the namespace stands for XML schema data types. So we don't have to say that 4 and 6 are different, because on the data side, in contrast to the object side, we have some version of unique name assumption. So those are different. Uh, and um, it, just come, it just comes built in as a part of language. And we can just use it. We can use it in data properties. So the data properties connect the worlds. They go from the abstract world of logic, 
where you have your Peter and Lois and Chris and all the individuals to the concrete that fits to make a world of data where you have the numbers or strings or dates. So you can say that, okay, Peter has weight of one and uh, you can just you can just use that. And uh, the interpretation of this connection of this data sum value from uh, where this wave is a data type property, the interpretation of that data type property is going to be a relation. And as you remember from the set theory class, relation is a set of pairs, where the first component in the pair will be uh, member of the abstract domain and the second component will be um, a member of the concrete domain. And I, I guess I have to draw this. So your model structure will look like this. We have one domain, abstract things, and there we will have beta. Right? We have this joint domain of of data. And somewhere here, we will have 100. We will, we will have some other things here as well, 200, or strings, or dates, and so on. And the uh, property has weight will be took as a relation connecting, connecting the world. So, you can have data axioms, which, which look very similar to object axioms. So we will keep on seeing this analysis between the object axioms and data axioms all the time. I'll remind you, of course, that every time we introduce a new data axiom, think about what would be the counterpart amongst the object axioms. Well, for example, the data, the data axioms. What do you say about data properties? What do you say about as we? We can say that for example, the person should have only one weight. Perfectly reasonable thing to do. If you if you if you model static things, things which do not evolve in time. And any other, any distant point of time your you weight is the same. You can say that um, two object uh, the data properties are equivalent, or you can build hierarchy of object properties. For example, you can say that as weight is a sub-data property of something like has physical characteristic that has height would be another sub-data property of has physical characteristic you have all that but you are a bit more limited compared to the object properties you are a bit more limited in what you can say about data properties and in general you cannot say anything about data properties which would either let you go the other way, you can't, or would let you, you know, stay completely in the data world. So data properties are exclusively for connecting uh, from the object world to the data world. That's all they can do. For that reason, you may not have chains. Because, well, first step you can do here, second step, you can't. Because chains don't make sense for data properties. You cannot have inverses. Because inverses means you need to go the other way. Not possible. You cannot have reflexive symmetry, you know, any kind of axiom to break the separation. Separation is a very much built into the design of our. So if you move work, work on, on the, this notion of fixed data semantics for data properties and data types, so remember, I, will, I, I, I never get tired of talking about this lack of unique name assumption in the object part. But here on the data side, so, so here you don't have unique name assumption. Stu and Lois you know, denote the same individual. But here if you have if you have hundred or two hundred, you don't have to say that those are different. They are, they are different because here we know what the numbers are. We know that numbers if are different, they're different end of story. So if you say that man, the age of man is 17 and somewhere somewhere else 
in your ontology you say that the age of man is 16, that's going to be inconsistent, inconsistent with the If you if you had to formalize that on the logical side, you would have to say that 17 and 16 are different individuals. But on the data side, you don't have to. Um, okay, I, I'm going to skip past of that. The only thing I want to say about data type is just to introduce a bit of a notation. So the collection of data type for a particular language, like how to or for a particular which, which, which is supported by a particular tool, the parameter the fact of palette is called data type map. So if someone says uh, my data type map, the tool developer, my data type map is the XSD boolean, XSD integer, XSD string, you need to understand that that those are data types that tool supports. Or for OWL, we have the standard data type map of OWL, which you can read in read this back. Or <laughs> I can talk about that. <laughs> so the standard out data type map which is built in in the language is basically a, uh, a collection of uh, data types defined in XML schema plus something else. Uh, and uh, that something else is just a few more data types like out real, out rational, which are there to um, Okay, I'll use the word clarify the relation between certain XML scheme and data types. So for example, the whole hierarchy of integers and decimals, they are under the OWL rational uh, and OWL view. And then that is just drawn from float and double. So now, if a number is a float number or is a double number, uh, then it cannot be So that, that, my understanding is that that was uh, uh, defined as that just based on the implementation experience. Most of it. No, the, the reason is that, in fact, there's two reasons. One is that in XML schema, they're defined as just all three are defined as primitive and destroyed. Yeah. So we were following that. The other problem, of course, is that floats and doubles contain things which are not reals or rationals. Right, okay. So minus zero plus zero minus infinity plus no, but, but infinity and, not, and all the not numbers. Yeah. Oh, but it, it could have been implemented differently. Like you could say, okay, like, every float is a double, for example. Or, but yeah, so we are just following the schema spec. Yes. There. It's just a choice. All right. So on the whole shift, Part of all, you could combine class expressions into more complex expressions, or name classes into complex expressions. We have a similar thing on the data side. You can take the, the data types from the auto data type map and combine them into so-called data ranges. So there's a strict analogy between name classes and data types and uh, class expressions and data ranges. Except that you have like freedom on the data side, just as with data properties. But you can say that a data range is either a data type, like this is the integer, or you can uh, uh, combine data types using positional connectives, like familiar union of, intersection of, complement of, kind of things. So you can union strings and integers and say, okay, this is the data type for my or like for my keys, for example, my something else. You can enumerate, uh, you can define the range by enumeration in the exact same way like you would define a class by enumeration. You can say, okay, uh, my data type is a, is a collection of two values. One is an integer and 2.5 is a double. Or you can apply data type restrictions on existing data types. That's what I will show next. So I'll give you a tool called Faces. If you're familiar with XSD schema, XML schema, then you know what the faces are. Those are uh, conditions which you apply to restrict the set of possible values of data type. So in our syntax, you can take a data type, DT stands for a data type, and you, for a data type, you can, uh, you can apply a collection of 
faces to the taken life. And every face is a is a is a is a pair where there is a constraining value v and constraining face. Just to give you an example, you can define the data range of all integers between 5 and 10. You can say that, or you can define the range of all integers between 5 and all the way up to infinity. Or all integers uh, under 18. For example, if you want to define the concept of a minor, someone who is not allowed to drink publicly and legally. And I can say, okay, a minor would be someone whose age is under 18 in this country. Okay. <laughs> or in, 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 most reasonable, in, in most reasonable countries. <laughs> um, and the important, important thing about faces is that they are, they are applied conjunctively. So if you, define, if you put a collection of faces on the data type, they are all combined with n. So if you restrict according to one face, What's left is restricted further by applying the next face. If there's anything left, it's not the face. Many faces you have. So yeah, I have a question. Mm -hmm. so only five to nine is very strange. Oh, see? Oh, yes, that's, good. that's a good one. I actually didn't talk about that. That face is exclusive. So it excludes the constraint value. So it's Does everyone understand the notation? That's the notation you should have seen in the conference class. And, um, well, I think I have like two or three minutes before the break, so I will just run the second data class. There's not much left in, in, in there, and, and after that we will just stop. So, you can define complex data types, but, but another nice thing about that, you can actually give them names, which makes them reusable. So you can say, okay, if I define my data type of email as a collection of strings which are which conform to a certain uh, regular expression, <coughs> I didn't bother to write it because it's incredibly complicated. You can actually say that, okay, I will give it a name in the exact same way I will give a name to a complex class. And then I can use that name in my data property axioms. I can say that the range of my has email uh, data property axiom, uh, data property is a set of all st strings from, from, from the value space email. And, uh, and, I, and I will stop there for the break. I don't want to stop anything with you uh, in the last minute. So, if you have any questions, let to ask now before you all forget about data types during the break. Okay, please. And then I just go and have coffee. Have coffee.